Hello, everyone, and happy Thursday morning. Despite the heat, we hope you've been having a wonderful summer. My name is Celeste, and I'm here with the Harris County Public Library System. Today, we hope to make your summer a little brighter by talking about everyone's favorite topic, animals. That's right. Today, we're going to meet some animals and learn about how their tails help them to survive. We're very happy to have not one, but five representatives from Harris County Precinct 1 to teach us and to show us some of their animal friends today. First, we have Haley. Hi, Haley. How are you today? I'm good. How are you doing? Doing great. So I think we're all excited to get started and learn about animals today. So go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you. So I am one of the naturalists with Harris County Precinct 1's Environmental Education Programs under Commissioner Rodney Ellis. You might be wondering what a naturalist is, and a naturalist is someone who studies all things nature. It could be plants, animals, or environmental impacts, or all of the above. And some of the programs that we offer at our two sites, we do have two sites. One is our North Learning Center at Alexander Dusen Park. And we have one in the South in Webster at Challenger 7 Memorial Park. And the programs that we offer at each of our sites or at other locations are our Polywog Club. We also have our Junior Naturalists, our Traveling Naturalist Programs, our Field Investigations, Service Learning Programs, and Discovery Camps. And if you would like to learn more about each of those programs, you can go check out the website under the Harris County Precinct 1, Commissioner Ronnie Ellis's website, and you can get more information about each of those programs. We also have another program that we offer called the Lee Internship, and that is the Learning Experience and Employment Program. And we have two of our wonderful interns here with us today, Miss Jocelyn and Miss Arabia, and you will get to meet both of them in just a little bit. Uh, but like Miss Celeste said, we are going to be talking about tails, animal tails today. So you may have wondered why animals have tails. What are they for? Do they have a purpose? Well, stick around and you will get to meet a lot of really cool animals and find out how their tails help them survive in their environments. So first off, let's get started with Miss Raven. All right, guys. Hi, how are you doing? I am Miss Raven, and I am one of the naturalists that's here at Alexander Dusen Park. So today I actually have a small mammal to show you. It's really cute. It's really furry, and it is actually an animal that is going to live underground. So you wouldn't really see these here, but this is a ferret. So you can see the picture. You can see how there's a little tunnel that he's sticking his head out of. That is the place that they are going to live. So some really good things about this one when it, we're talking about the tail is going to be that they actually can use their tail for balance. So sometimes you may see an animal walking across the power lines, right? And you may notice if you look a little bit closer that they're actually going to have that tail sticking straight out. You can think it, you can see it with maybe a squirrel or maybe a rat. If you see them walking across, they'll have it straight out. And the reason that they are going to do that is because that tail is actually going to help them with balance, right? Nobody wants to fall off the power line when they're walking on it. So they're going to have that tail straight out so it can help them. So balance is something that's really important for these kinds of animals and they'll use their tail for it. Something else that's really good um, when coming talking about a tail is going to be that they actually can use their tail to communicate. So just like you see me, I'm talking to you. You can hear the words that I'm saying, right? You understand me. That's because that's the way that we communicate, but animals can communicate in different types of ways, right? So what this one is going to do is it can actually wag its tail, which is really, really cute. And so when it does it, it can do that for two different reasons. So you'll see them wagging his tail and they can do that because they're really excited. They're excited to play. They're excited to see a friend. 
And so they'll wag that tail just like you would see like a dog doing, right? And so another reason that they would wag that tail is if they are about to catch their food. So let's say that my ferret has a rat that it's going after, right? If the ferret gets that rat and it gets it kind of trapped in the corner, sometimes you will see them wag their tail right before they catch it. That's because that's something exciting for them, right? So they have that food that they're going to get and they're excited about it because they're going to get their meal right they can't just go to the store like we go to the store they have to actually catch their meal so once they have that then they'll wag their tail and then they will go after it so that's a way that they will use their tail to communicate right so other ways that they can use it besides just wagging it is actually going to be they can have their tail smooth or they can actually kind of frenzy their tail and it'll be going in different directions. So if that happens, then you know, hey, maybe my ferret isn't that happy right now if they don't have their tail smooth or if they do have it smooth, then you know that he's pretty happy or he's pretty content with whatever is going on right there. So they'll use their tail for balance. They will use their tail in order to communicate and then they can also use their tail in a really, really cute kind of way, right? So sometimes you will see mammals and what they're doing is they're sleeping, right? And you'll see them all curled up in the ball. And so you can see the picture there. The ferret has his tail kind of curled around him, right? So what's really cute about it is they'll actually use that and they'll do that. They'll kind of cover their face and that's a way that they kind of feel a little bit safe and they feel protected. And sometimes they'll actually sleep with um, other ferrets. So we have her sister and they will actually sleep together and they'll curl up and they'll use those tails in order to protect each other or feel protected. And so again, those main ways that they are going to use their tails are going to be for balance. It's going to be to communicate with each other and is also going to be used whenever they are asleep. They'll use that to kind of curl up and cover their face. So now that we talked about some pretty cool things that they do with their tail, I'm just going to tell you some other general information about my ferret. So again, I already told you that these ferrets can be found underground in tunnels. And so you can look at their body and you can see how kind of slender she is, right? So you can look at her and say, hey, this is an animal that might live underground because their body is so slender and it's made for tunnels. And something else that they can do is they can kind of look. Like, See how she can fold and it doesn't hurt her at all. So that's good because if they're underground and they're in a tunnel, if they need to turn around really quick, that is something that they can do because of the way that their bodies are. So again, these bodies are made for them to be underground in tunnels. Now, if you've ever heard of a prairie dog, that's another small type of mammal. So these ferrets would actually go and hunt prairie dogs. That's one of the main things that they love to eat. And so what happens is they would find those prairie dogs and they would go down in their tunnels and they would actually eat the prairie dogs and take those tunnels away from them, right? And so even though you can see that she does have claws, they would actually use the, uh, the tunnels that the prairie dogs made. And so that's what they would have for their meal. And they would also get a home out of the deal, right? And so there's kind of a relationship between ferrets and prairie dogs. So there kind of used to be a lot of Blackfoot ferrets out in the wild. And so they would eat the prairie dogs, right? But prairie dogs also eat vegetables, right? So we would have farmers and they would wake up in the morning and they would be like, where's all my crops? And so prairie dogs actually would go and they would be eating those crops that the farmers worked hard to kind of grow, right? Do they like that? Probably not. So once those farmers started kind of getting rid of the prairie dogs, what do you think happened to my ferrets out in the wild? they kind of started to disappear because again, the prairie dogs were one of the main things that they would eat. 
And so when there wasn't so many prairie dogs around, then it started to not be a lot of ferrets around. They do still have some in the wild, and they're trying to get even more out in the wild um, by making little programs and trying to teach them to hunt. All right. So there's a kind of relationship again between my ferrets and my prairie dogs. Now you can look at the teeth. Oh, look there. She opened them. You can look at her teeth and did they look flat or did they look sharp? They look sharp, right? So if you're looking at the teeth of an animal and they look sharp, then what can that tell you? That can tell you that that's probably a carnivore or something that is going to be eating meat. I told you they could eat um, rats. I told you that they could eat prairie dogs, right? So that's not the kind of meat that we would want to eat probably, but for them, that's the meat that they eat. So again, by looking at her teeth and you being able to see that they are sharp, then you know that this animal is something that is going to be eating meat and it is a type of carnivore just by looking at the teeth. If you look at our teeth, we have sharp teeth and we also have flat teeth, right? So that lets us know that we're going to be eating meat and we're going to be eating different types of vegetables, all right? So just by looking at those teeth, I can tell what this one is going to eat. Now, if you were right next to me, you might say, oh my gosh, that bear stinks. So they do have a little bit of a smell to them. I think Miss Raven is just kind of used to it. So it doesn't smell horrible to me, but they do have a little bit of a smell, which is good for my animal. And it's good for them because then they can kind of mark their territory, right? They'll know, hey, this is my area. I don't want anybody else in this area. And so that smell is good for them to get their scent on different things. Also, it can be good whenever they have babies, right? So you can mark that scent in your babies. You'll be able to tell where they are. So that's something else that is good that my fair will use. I already showed you the claws, right? So you see the claws and you can see that they are pretty sharp. I actually clipped them not that long ago, um, but they can get really sharp. I told you that they will take the prairie dogs homes, right? But if they wanted to, could they dig their own home? Absolutely. They could dig their own tunnels that are out in the prairies that would be underground. And then they'll have different types of dens for them, right? So they may have a den that they sleep in, that they can curl up in, or they might have a little bit of a den where they have their food in them. Right, so we talked about some pretty awesome things with the ferret. We learned that they use their tail for balance. We learned that they use them to communicate and that they can also use them when they are covering up to sleep. So that was the only one animal that we were gonna show you. And now you're gonna learn even more about corn snakes with Miss Jocelyn. Thank you, Raven. Thank you, Miss Raven. Hello, my name is Miss Jocelyn, and today I'm going to be speaking about the corn snake. So the corn snake gets its name from its corn-like pattern. So usually they'll have different color variations, and usually they'll be a more orangey red color, and they look like corn or maize that you find in cornfields. They can get up to two to six feet long. So, that's how they get their name. Sorry, he's moving a lot. Where they live is they usually live in the southeastern region of America, and you can usually find them in Florida. And in that pink region you can see on the picture, that's where they're usually found. You can find them in cornfields or in other types of fields. You can find them in barns, and you can even find them on forest floors. Now, when you look at a snake or when you think of a snake, you might think they're just one long tail, but actually snakes have a body and a tail. So how to tell that is you locate their cloaca and their cloaca is where they use the restroom or where they give birth. So from their head to their cloaca is their body and they have their bones and their organs in there. And then from the cloaca to the tip of their tail is their tail. So I can't really show 
detail on this one, but it's wrapped around my wrist, you can tell. Um, but different snakes have different type of tails that they use for different reasons to survive in their environment. So land snakes like the corn snake or like a rattlesnake can have round tails. So this corn snake has a round tail. Sea snakes actually have flat tails and those tails help them to swim like that. So they use their tail to swim like a fish. And other types of tails are used um, for tree snakes. So tree snakes have what they call prehensile tails. So those tails can help them hold on to trees or other stuff. And they wrap around tree branches so that they can hang on um, to the tree and then they can slither around the tree. And snakes can actually use their tails as a defense mechanism. So one snake that we know that uses it is a rattlesnake. So you can see that their tail is kind of shaped differently and they actually shake their tails to warn off predators and that protects them um, in the wild. They can also use it to poke their predators. So they use their sharp tails to distract them and then they can get away very quickly. Um, another way that snakes can use their tail is to lure prey. So baby copper snakes actually have bright yellow tails when they're babies. And they use those tails to lure in prey. And then once the prey gets close enough, they can get them and eat them. And that's how the baby snakes are able to find food when they're young and they're able to grow faster. Now, usually snakes will just eat mice small rodents, um, other small reptiles. This one usually eats mice and rats. Um, that's why you can usually find them in cornfields. Farmers like to keep them in the cornfields because they eat the mice. Um, you can, they usually can eat those mice or small reptiles whole and they can eat them whole because they have a jaw bone that helps them extend their mouth. So in the back of their jaw, they have an extra bone that helps them widen their mouth and then they can extend their mouth. So them eating a whole egg like that is like us eating a whole cantaloupe. And then they can also, so the copper snake has retractable teeth. So it can help like scoop in the egg. And then they can also, they also have an extra chin ligament. You can see in this picture right here, it kind of scoops up the egg on their chin. So to review what we learned about our corn snake is that they get their name from their corn like pattern on their bodies. They are usually found in the southeastern region of America, usually in Florida. You can find them in cornfields and then that different snakes have different tails and they use them for different ways like the sea snakes have flat tails to help them swim tree snakes wrap around stuff and help them hang on uh, they can use it as a defense mechanism or to lure prey so thank you so much for hearing about my corn snake oh they're getting very <laughs> moving a lot and now we're going to move on to miss arabia with our next animal Today, I have with me a leopard gecko. You can see him there. So leopard geckos are pretty cool. And one of the coolest things about his tail is that he can actually drop his tail. So if you can see his tail right there. So he can actually detach his tail from his body or drop his tail. And this happens whenever he is scared or afraid or there is a predator around him and he wants to get away. So he will drop his tail. And one of the cool things that happens when he drops his tail is that his tail can actually still move around. So it can move and wiggle even though it's not on his body. And so this is so that the predator will be distracted from him so he can run away. The predator may think that he has him, even though he doesn't, because his tail is still moving around. 
So this is very, very important because he doesn't want to be eaten. So predators are animals that want to eat him. So he doesn't want to be eaten. So his tail, by dropping his tail or detaching his tail, he can get away as fast as he can. Now, dropping his tail, you may think, okay, does he get a new tail? Well, sometimes, yes. Most of the time, he can. So what actually happens is he will molt or shed his skin. His skin will peel off. And every time he does that, his tail begins to grow. So it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen super duper fast. But every time he sheds his skin, his tail will grow a little bit and then a little bit more and then a little bit more. And that's important because he needs his tail. He needs his tail because it not only helps him to get away from predators, but he has other uses for his tail. So another great use for his tail is actually storing food. So in the tip of his tail down here, he can store his food. He can store fat and then he will be able to drop his tail and then be able to eat that food when it's during winter months. So he will drop his tail and eat that food when it's winter months. Like there's not a lot of food around. There's um, not a lot of animals that he can find to eat. So he will use his last resort, which he wants it to be his last resort, because once that food is gone, there's nothing else. Hopefully there's more animals around for him to eat. So um, that's important for him. And now when he does grow his tail, he wants to make sure that when he drops his tail, it doesn't go to a certain place. So let's say he dropped his tail right here. Now he will grow it back again. But if he decides to drop his tail back all the way up here, the next time he won't be able to grow his tail back. So the higher up he drops his tail each time, that way he won't be able to grow his tail back. And it's very important for him because his tail has lots of uses. Like we said, his tail helps him to stay alive because he, need, he needs food to grow and he'll be able to store food in there. And then dropping his tail will allow him to get away from predators. So he wants to grow his tail back just in case he has to drop his tail again. Now, we talked about shedding and we talked about how it helps to drop his tail and grow his tail back. But gecko shedding can help them in more ways than one. So when a gecko sheds, he actually eats his shed. So he eats that skin that he sheds off. And you may think, ew, that's gross. But it actually helps him in a lot of ways. So he will eat that shed. And that shed is full of nutrients and vitamins and all of these things that he needs to grow. All of that is inside that shed. And so he will eat that so he can grow and he wants to grow. We never want to be small forever. He wants to grow. Another reason that he eats his shed is because he doesn't want predators or animals that eat him, like we said, to find him. He never wants to be eaten. So he will eat that shed so the predators won't be able to find him or track him down or say, hey, I see shed. That means he must be going this way or he must be going that way, or he must be around here somewhere. The leopard gecko does not want that to happen. He does not want the predators to find him, so he will eat his shed. Now, there are some other cool things about him that help to protect him, and one of those things has to do with his eyes. So when we see our eyelashes, we see, we see protection. We think of protection. So he doesn't have hair on his eyelids, but he actually has these little bumps. You can see on the picture because you can't really see it on him, but he has these little bumps on his eyelids that help him the same way our eyelashes do. So our eyelashes help us to protect us from dirt and dust and anything bad that can get into our eyes that can hurt our eyes. 
So the bumps on his eyelids do the same thing because if you didn't know, leopard geckos are actually from the desert. So they live in the desert. And if you know, in the desert, there's a lot of wind and there's a lot of sand and there's always something blowing, dirt and dust all over the place. And so he doesn't want all of that to get into his eyes. So he has those bumps on his eyes, that adaptation on his eyes that help him to not get any of those bad things in his eyes because he wants to see. We all want to see. We all have to see because he wants to be able to see where he's going. He wants to be able to see what he's doing, make sure there are no predators around him or anything like that. Another thing that is on his body that helps him to, that protects him from the dirt and the dust on his ears. So humans have uh, big holes in their ears and there's not a lot of protection. But for geckos, they have, as you can see in the picture, these little slits on his ear. So where that red part is, that is a little slit on his ear. And it helps him to keep out, just like the bumps on his eyelids, to keep out the dirt and the dust and all the bad stuff that can get into his eyes or his ears, sorry. And so he doesn't want any of that in his ears. So just like the bumps on his eyes protect his eyes from the dirt, the ear slits protect his ears from the dirt. Now, we've talked about some of the coolest things that leopard geckos have. So let's get into some general things about him. Now, he is called a, le a leopard gecko. And if you can see here, he has these spots all on his body, all those spots on his body. And those spots look like the spots on a leopard. That's why he's called a leopard gecko, because he has all those spots all along his body, those leopard looking spots all on his body. Now, he is a reptile, which means that he is cold blooded. So when you're cold blooded, whatever temperature it is around you is the same temperature that's inside your body. So let's say it's 20 degrees outside, it's super duper cold and the leopard geckos out there. Well, his body will also be 20 degrees. He'll also be 20 degrees. Let's say it's 70 degrees outside. His body will also be 70 degrees. So cold blooded means that whatever temperature it is around you, it's the same temperature that's inside of you, or inside your body. Now, if you can see here, his little feet, he has little bitty claws on his feet. And these claws help him to climb trees or to climb up on rocks. And they help him to get around fast because he is a pretty fast animal. And so those claws help him to get around fast and to climb things like trees and rocks and things that he needs. And it can also help him to get away from predators. So like we said before, like he's dropping his tail, he needs those claws to get away and run away while his tail is back there behind him doing all the work. So he has those claws. Now, when you may think of a gecko, you may think of the ones that we have outside or the ones that we see outside, the ones that stick to the windows, they stick to the buildings, they stick all around, they look like they're jumping or hopping. Those geckos have little hairs on their hands that help them to stick to windows and things like that. For the leopard gecko, he doesn't have that. So he doesn't stick. He's not the type of gecko that can stick to things like that. But he does have those claws that help him get up on trees and things like that. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed the leopard gecko and everything that we learned about him. Up next, we have Miss Christina, who has a glass lizard. Hi guys, I'm Miss Christina and I am the senior naturalist down at the Challenger 7 Learning Center, which is down in Webster, the very southern tip of precinct one. So I have a really cool and unique animal to share with you. And it's an animal that can be found around here, but it may not be an animal you have seen or think you have seen out in the wild. So let me show you, so let me show her to you. 
And so here I have a very long and slender animal. I want you to take a good look at her. I'm going to show you her whole body all the way to the tail. And I want you to think to yourself, what in the world, what kind of animal do you think this is? Now, I bet a lot of you are probably thinking snake right about now, right? Because I see a long, slender animal, and it has no arms, no legs. It looks like a snake. It probably is a snake, right? Well, guess what? It's actually not a snake. This is a very special animal called a slender glass lizard, okay? These lizards are found around here, just as I said. They're found in the central and eastern United States. And you can find them living out in open grasslands, open forests. You can find them on rocky hillsides. This particular one was collected in a coastal prairie down um, by the beach. So they can be found in a wide variety of habitats here um, in our part of the country. And you see that map right there. And I love that map because it shows a very good division there. And I wonder if you can figure out what that division is as to why their habitat is split um, I'm thinking probably a river of some sort that, fl that flows that direction, right? Um, so these guys are really cool. Now, what in the world, how do I know that this is a lizard and not a snake? Okay, and it's going to have something to do with some of those characteristics that Miss Arabia just talked about. Um, first thing you're going to look for are eyelids. Okay, Miss Arabia just talked about the leopard gecko having some amazing eyelids. Well, my lizard, I'm going to get her really close, has eyelids too. Every now and then you will see her blink. Okay, if it blinks, it's not a snake. Snakes actually do not have eyelids. They have a scale that protects their eye. So they will never blink. You will never win a staring contest with a snake. It will always win that contest. But with a lizard, you have a shot, okay? So she has eyelids. I don't know how often she'll blink, but every now and then you might see her do it. Another characteristic you look for are those ear holes that Miss Arabia uh, talked about. And they're kind of hard to see on my lizard. I'm gonna see if I can get her right there. And it's hard to see on her because her patterns are very modeled, and but if there's a little slit, instead of being vertical like the leopard gecko in that picture you just saw, um, hers are actually horizontal. Let's see if I can get a better angle on her. Sometimes she cooperates, sometimes she doesn't. I don't know. It's like right below my finger right there. That's her ear hole. So lizards have ear holes. They hear sound through the air, just like you and I do. Now, she doesn't know what I'm saying. She doesn't speak my language, but she can hear that I am producing sound, okay? A snake would not be able to hear you because snakes, believe it or not, do not have ears, not in the sense that you and I do, okay, or like this lizard does. Snakes, instead of hearing sound in the air, like you and I do, they actually feel sound through their jaw bones. The bones that are in your, or that make up your ear, actually are incorporated into a snake's jaws. And so that's how they sense sound, okay? Um, now, another characteristic that kind of distinguishes this animal from a snake, okay, is the snakes are very, very flexible animals. I'm sure you saw the snake that Miss Jocelyn had and how, how much it moved around and twisted around, wrapped, her, wrapped itself around her wrist. Well, this animal, while she can kind of loop around a little bit, she actually has a very rigid body which is true for many lizards, especially glass lizards. They have very um, tough scales and they're very rigid, okay? So she can only loop so far, but she's not gonna hold on to me with her, with her body at all. I'm just kind of holding her. Um, because her body is so rigid, I want you to look at her side and I want you to watch her breathe. Let me make sure I get her nice and centered. See if I, can you see her breathing right there, right above where my mouth is? You can see that her body is expanding. And you can see there's kind of this ridge that goes from behind her ear, starts right there where my finger is, goes all the way down her body to her cloaca, that the, the, the basically the rear end of the animal, okay? And that lateral groove that goes down her body, she's got them on both sides, um, that just helps her body expand a little bit when she's breathing or when she's eating or maybe if she's producing eggs or something like that, she's going to have more room to do that um, because of her rigid, rigid body. Okay, so there's just some characteristics you can look for to try to determine if the animal you're seeing um, is a glass lizard or if it might be a snake. There are some snakes that um, these lizards can get mistaken for, which is why a lot of people may not realize they, they might be seeing them. Um, the ribbon snake um, is one that you find around here or some kind of garter snake. They have a very similar color and pattern and even length. And sometimes they get confused with these lizards or vice versa. Okay, so what are some cool facts about these lizards other than all of those really distinguishable characteristics? 
Well, these lizards are typically found roaming around during the daytime. And I know that. I want you to look at her face again if she'll stop moving. Probably not. She's getting fed up. Oh, let me get the camera. See if you can. You can see that she has nice round eyes. You see those nice round eyes? Round eyes on an animal typically tells you that that animal is most likely a daytime animal. And that's what she is. She is called diurnal. So she comes out during the daytime um, to look for food. They typically leave, live by themselves, so they're going to hunt by themselves as well. And the food that they like to eat, all lizards um, are, most of them, I'm going to say all lizards, this type of lizard, all of the glass lizards, they are carnivores. So they're going to eat primarily meat. Now, they're not going to go hunting down big things like mice and birds and things like that. They're going to eat tiny things. See, look how tiny she is, okay? She's going to eat a lot of insects maybe some worms. She's going to eat um, spiders and other arthropods, whatever she can get her mouth on. She does have teeth. They're very tiny. Um, all lizards have teeth in their mouth, but she's not going to open it and show me the inside. So <laughs> we're not that lucky today. Um, but she does eat um, a lot of meat. Now, these guys at nighttime, they will um, settle down in burrows underground or they'll hide under something. If there's like you've got a porch or a deck, they might go hide under that. Um, but if they can't find cover, then they will find old burrows dug out by other animals and they will be able to hide in those. They're not really great at digging. Obviously, they don't have legs. Um, if it's soft enough soil, they can use their head to kind of wiggle their way down and make some little tunnels. Um, but the soil would have to be soft enough for them to build that on their own. Now you see, look at what she's doing. And, and that's another reason they get mistaken for snakes a lot. You see that she just keeps flicking that tongue out. Well, just like snakes, lizards too, a lot of them will stick out their tongue just like a snake does. And they're using it in the same way a snake would. They are trying to smell and pick up scents in their environment. The neat thing about their tongue, it's a little bit different than a snake tongue. Snake tongues are very long and skinny and they're deeply forked, okay? So there's a split in them and you've got two different parts to the tip. And that allows the snake to be able to scent smells in different directions. Well, the same thing is true for lizards, but most of the time their lizards, although they are forked, they're just not as deeply forked as a snake's is, but they're using that tongue in the same way. So they stick that tongue out, their tongues are able to pick up the smells in the air and then they bring it back in their mouth and they've got a special organ on the roof of their mouth called the Jacobson's organ that allows them to kind of interpret what it is they're smelling. OK, and they can sense if there's danger nearby or maybe there's food nearby. Um, so that's what they're that's what she's doing when she's sticking that tongue out. She's being very curious. OK, now these lizards, like most reptiles, are what we call oviparous. Okay, which means they do lay eggs. Okay, there's a, there's a lot of different ways that the reptiles can have their babies, but most of them are oviparous. They lay their eggs. Now, this one will lay her eggs about five to 15 is about average. Average is probably about eight. They will lay eggs in a very soft area, usually under cover. So maybe under some logs or under a rock or under some boards. And what's neat about this lizard is that they actually will protect their eggs. That's not true for most lizards. Most lizards, they'll lay their eggs in a nice, what they feel is a secure spot, and then they hightail it out of there, they're done. Their job is done. But for this lizard, they will actually stick around and protect their eggs the best they can. The reason they do that, and it's a wonderful adaptation, is that this allows their eggs the opportunity to have a higher chance of actually hatching and the babies being able to join us in this world. Um, if they just left their eggs, then there's a very high probability that other predators might be able to sniff them out and eat them. But by protecting them, they are giving them a, a much higher chance of survival. And once the babies hatch, they're on their own. Mom, mom and dad, they just go on their way. Um, and the babies are, are good to go as the second they hatch. Okay. Now, what I want to really talk about, um, and it's part of how they got their name since we're talking about tails, is her tail. Okay. Now her tail, so here's her body. You know, Miss Jocelyn talked about snakes being mostly body and a little bit of tail. Well, for this lizard, she is mostly tail and a little bit of body. So her from her head to her cloaca, her cloaca is right there. You see that little indentation? That's her rear end. And then look at all the rest of this that is tail. She has an extremely long tail and they get their name slender glass lizard because of their tail. So like Miss Arabia said with the leopard gecko, they can... Um, drop their tail if needed. This lizard is just like those lizards that she can drop her tail as well if she feels um, the need to. But what's interesting is these lizards, instead of having to be grabbed by a predator, 
that you can just look at them the wrong way and they have the ability to release parts of their tail. And not only will it release just one part, it can actually break in several places as if it's shattering like glass. And that's where they get their name because their tail is very fragile. It can break in several different places and it can just break just like that. You don't even have to touch it for them to drop their tail. Now these pictures you're just seeing, they are um, a picture of a slender glass lizard that had dropped its tail. And what I love about those pictures is that if you look at them, they're, they're both sides of the tail, the part that's still attached to the body and the part that it has detached. And if you look, you can see, especially the pictures up now, you can see all the different muscles that are sticking out. And then the previous picture you saw, there were all these little like cavities, right? There it is, look at those, all those little cavities. So what I like to say is the different pieces when they break, it's almost like they fit together like Lego pieces. My son, I have Lego pieces all over my house. So we're putting them together left and right, but that's kind of how this tail fits together. The muscles fit into those cavities and when they have the, those releases, um, they just kind of slip apart, okay? Now, like the leopard gecko, her tail will grow back. Um, it's not like, like Ms. Rabies says, not a short, it's not a quick process. It takes some time. But when it grows back, it's never going to grow back exactly the same. It's going to grow back, um, may not grow back as long. Um, and it's going to be a different color. They quite often will not uh, have all these patterns and stuff on their tail. You see in that picture right there, that slender glass is trying to grow it back as well. Um, and it'll be just a solid color. So you can usually tell if these guys have dropped their tail or not. In mine, we've been lucky that this, this lizard <laughs> has yet to ever drop. She's a very good program animal. She has never dropped her tail that we know of, with the exception of maybe the very tip of her tail. Let's see if I can. It very tip of her tail looks a little different. You see right there from my finger down. It looks like it's a little bit of a different color than the rest. So maybe when she was younger, she did drop the tip of her tail and it regrew. But all the rest of her tail is still its natural patterns and colors. So, so far, this, this lizard has not felt the need that she needed to drop her tail. Um, when it grows back, like Miss Arabia said, um, it will grow back, but she will have to drop it at different locations every single time because once it grows back, it does. She doesn't regrow the vertebrae and the muscles and all that. In fact, most of it grows back as cartilage, and so she loses the ability to drop it at the points that she has previously dropped it, and would have to drop it higher and higher. Once she drops it at the base of her tail, she will. Not, she can regrow it, but it, she will not be able to drop it again. She will lose that defense mechanism. Um, and she'll just have to rely on her good old escape skills <laughs> to get away from her predators. Okay. All right. Um, I do have another animal for you guys to meet. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I do. I have a surprise animal. All right. So this is a slender glass. It's a wonderful tail. The other one I'll just go really quick with. Um, but it's also really cool. She's got a few different characteristics. Let me pull her out. She's a lot bigger than these other guys we've had. All right, let me show you this girl. All right, see if I can get her to sit on my arm. So this lizard is a little bit different than um, the other lizards you've already seen, okay? Um, this is called a blue tongue skink. And blue tongue skink, depending on the, sub the species, can be found in um, either Australia or Indonesia in those places. This one's a northern blue tongue skink, so she comes from Australia. And you can see in her tongue why she's called the blue tongue skink, right? She's really good at sticking out that tongue. And it is blue, bright, bright blue. It's not blue because she's been drinking the blue Kool-Aid. It's because that is a defense mechanism for her. Because in nature, things that are brightly colored tend uh, to mean that they're dangerous in some way. Now, she's not dangerous. She's not venomous. She's not poisonous. But she wants you to think that maybe she could be. And so what happens is um, when she is cornered by a predator, she will... Um, puff up her body, hiss really loud, and then open up that mouth and stick that tongue out. And she's hoping that that predator will think twice about maybe making her a meal if it sees that bright blue color and might think that she might be a little bit more deadly than she actually is, okay? Um, now, tail-wise on this animal, this animal, like all the other, she's shedding. You can see you've got all these scales that are coming off, okay? This tail can also be dropped in, in skinks. Skinks are a, a special type of lizard. This is just one different, uh, one specific breed, uh, species of skink. We do have some that live around here as well. But they also, like the slender glass, like the leopard gecko, can drop their tails and regrow them. Now, these lizards are o, uh, ovoviviparous, which means when they have their babies, they don't lay eggs in their environment. What they do is the females will actually retain the eggs on the inside of their body. 
so that when the eggs basically hatch, they will be born essentially alive. So this lizard's a little bit different than those others that we've met today. In the wild, these are daytime lizards, so they do come out during the day and they are omnivores. So these guys will eat plants and crickets and, and snails and, and whatever kind of little insects and things that they can get their mouths on, okay? So this is another really cool lizard. I'm going to show you her whole body. She's really, really big. It's probably the fattest one I have ever in my life <laughs> handled. Um, but she is a very, very big lizard. This is probably, I think it's the second largest species of skink in the world are the northern blue tongues. Okay. All right, guys. Well, that's it for our animals today. I'm going to pass the baton back over to Ms. Raven, and she is going to wrap it up for us. Okay. All right. So I hope that you guys really, really enjoyed that program because I know I did. So even though I'm the naturalist, right? Do you think that means that I know every single thing that there is to know about animals? No, so I was really excited to learn about the glass lizard. Um, the other animals that we talked about, remember we had the ferret, we had the glass lizard, we had the corn snake, and then we also had the leopard gecko. So in each one of those animals, we tried to show you the really cool things and the adaptations and the ways that they use their tails, um, because that is what this whole program is about, learning different ways that they use their tails and maybe different ways that they can use it to communicate than us. Um, so I really hope you enjoyed that program that the Harris County Public Library put on for us. So we do have programs that are put on by the Harris County Public Library. Here at the north side at Alexander Dusen Park, we serve North Channel and we also serve um, serve Aldine. And so right now we actually have programs going on at Aldine Library that are virtual and they are going to be the last Fridays of the month at 11 o'clock. We also have the Southside Center at Webster that puts on virtual programs with the Harris County Public Library and they do it with Parker Williams. Um, so those are the different locations that we are going to have our virtual programs at right now. And then one day, hopefully we will get back into those libraries to do um, those programs in person. And so what we're gonna do right now while we still have a little bit of time is we are going to go into questions and answers with me and Miss Christina. Wow, wow, that was so interesting. <laughs> I learned so much stuff about all of these animals. I mean, it's amazing. So we have a lot of our Harris County friends watching us virtually today. One of them's name is Rayanne, and they want us to know that their favorite animal is panda. I like pandas too. <laughs> all right, so let's go into our first question, and this is from Sheila. So Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Christina, Ms. Raven. So whoever wants to answer, y'all can answer. And they want to, Sheila wants to know, do any animals eat ferrets? Okay, so yeah, there are animals that um, eat ferrets, just like we're out at Jurassic a food chain. So everything at some point in time is probably going to be eaten. And so for our ferrets, um, different things that love to eat them are going to be types of birds. So you have your big owls, right? Or you have your hawks. Those can be different types of animals that would eat them. Also, um, other types of mammals. So maybe a coyote that we have out there, that might be something that is going to eat a ferret. So um, something that's bigger than it that would be able to catch it, um, it's going to try and take advantage of it if it can. So again, birds, coyotes, different animals like that would eat ferrets. Yeah, big animals, because I imagine they're quite heavy. <laughs> they're kind of long, too. All right, so our next question. So corn snakes were really interesting. And what was so interesting is that they're named after a food. Are there any other animals that y'all know of that are named after a food? Yeah, milk snakes, another snake. They're named <laughs> after, uh, they're not named after, they don't, of course, don't drink milk, which is a, a common misconception. But um, yeah, there's always gonna be animals that have food in their names. Some animals are named very methodically and they have, um, very special names. Some are very obvious. Um, some are very difficult and we don't know where they come from. Um, but yeah, so another one that I can think off of the top of my head is probably the, the milk snake. Um, and they're named that not because they eat the milk, but because um, they're quite often found in barns um, or farmers keep like their dairy cows and things like that. 
Yeah, so interesting. It was so cool also to learn about the gecko with Mesorabia. So what kind of food do the geckos store in their tail? So for the geckos, you may not be able to see their teeth, but they do have little tiny teeth. Um, and they are carnivores. And so some of the things that we feed them here is we will actually give them crickets. So and not something that we would want to eat when we're thinking about things that are meat. Um, but for them, they love it and they like to go after it. And so just kind of how you saw the ferret wagging its tail um, before it eats the cricket, the gecko does the same thing and is the cutest little thing. So they'll eat crickets, they'll eat um, mealworms. Sometimes we'll give them mealworms as well. Wow. Do any other animals store their food in their tail or maybe another body part to eat later? Tails are a common place that they, that they store. What were you going to say, Raven? No, I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, how interesting. And we have another. For me, question. I store it in other places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think humans are quite different, right? <laughs> um, we have another question here from Aisha. And they want to know, can he, the leopard gecko, choose how high or low he sheds the tail? All right, so like um, Ms. Christina kind of touched on that a little bit and when she said that there's specific places in which they can break their tail or which their tail will drop. And so it's not like he sits there and says, oh, I'm gonna drop at this location, right? When, when something is chasing you, you kind of have to drop it when you can. And so they'll just pick one of those locations that's kind of um, assigned to them and then they'll drop it there. Oh, how interesting. Um, okay, let me see. What other questions do we have? I know we have a couple more. Um, how big do, another corn snake question. How big do corn snakes get? The corn snakes, um, they're a very slender snake, but they can grow anywhere from two, four, six feet long. I think the long, I think the average is probably four to five feet. Um, that, I don't know how long that one is. Um, I don't know if it's been measured or not, but it's probably look pretty long. So I'd say it's probably about four to five. It's probably in that range, four to five feet. Oh, wow. And someone else asked, uh, why is the snake, why was the snake sticking out his tongue? For the same reason the lizard was. So they, they use the, the tongue to pick up smells in the air. Um, and so it's just an extra way. They have a nose. They can smell with their tongue. I mean, with their nose too. They breathe with their nose more, but they do use their tongue because your sense of taste and your sense of smell are very closely linked. Um, they use that tongue to also pick up scents. So it's the same thing. Wow, that is so interesting. Um, I think we all learned so much today. We're so happy that Precinct One came out and all of your helpers and all of the naturalists were here together. Um, it was so good to see your teamwork and everyone knows so much about animals. I'm jealous because I didn't know. <laughs> I thought I knew a lot about animals, but I, uh, I a lot of the information that we learned today was very new. So we're so excited to see you guys virtually at some of our other libraries. Um, but for now, we're all done with our questions today. But thank you so much um, to Raven and Christina for answering all of our questions. Thank you. Yes, and thank you so much to our partners today's program possible. Just in case you didn't know, while we're having fun learning about animals today, you earned five points for our Tells and Tells summer reading program. If you haven't registered yet, you could do so easily at hcpl.beanstack.org and select the summer reading program to get your points for today. So what you're going to do is you're going to click on the log activity at the top left corner and select the plus sign next to attended a virtual library program. And that's it. You get five points for your summer total. So we hope if you want some more points, you hope you and your family will join us to continue celebrating Juneteenth tonight at 7 p.m. for our African Spirituals with Joseph Dixon virtual program with our partners from ArtReach. So hopefully we get to see you again tonight. We hope you and your family have a wonderful rest of the day and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you.